Hey, everybody. Kevin Grossman, president of Talent Board. I hope you are all safe and well during these challenging times. And keeping communication open with all of your candidates, external as well as your internal employees, is probably more critical than ever before. Letting them know that even if hiring is slowing for your organization, you still want to do a better job at recruiting and hiring. This can help with your overall perceived fairness and brand perception in the near term and the long term. Plus, understanding your candidate experience strengths, weaknesses, and perception gaps will help you better understand and ultimately make improvements to your processes that will benefit you today and in the future once we're beyond this healthcare crisis. Thanks for your time, everybody, and enjoy the podcast. We've seen companies switch to some more employer branding versus you know, what we could see on the other side of the continuum where it's strictly direct response applicant volume. And, and I think people have been kind of shocked that those that are hiring are finding that it's kind of confusing to them why they're not getting more applicants You know, with the unemployment being so high. You're listening to the Candy Shop Talk podcast brought to you by Talent Board and the Candidate Experience Awards Benchmark Research and hosted by Kevin W. Grossman. Talent Board is the first nonprofit research organization focused on elevating and promoting a quality candidate experience. The Candy Shop Talk podcast welcomes Neil Costa, founder and CEO of HireClicks, a digital recruitment marketing agency and a proud Candidate Experience Awards sponsor. Listen in on how improving candidate experience impacts recruiting in the business bottom line. Neil, thank you so much for joining me on the Candy Shop Talk podcast. Before we dive into the rest of this episode, why don't you tell us a little bit more about who Neil is and what we're doing today, what you're doing today. Sure. Uh, my name is Neil Costa. I'm the founder and CEO of HireClicks. Started HireClicks just over 10 years ago, and we are a recruitment marketing services company. Been in the industry for a while before that. Worked at Monster.com and My Perfect Gig, which was some TA matching technology back in the day. And, I remember. Uh, you remember? I remember. My perfect, yeah. So we, um, you know, started the agency in 2010, and you know, it was the tail end of a recession there, and you know, we're it's almost like we're coming full cycle in 10 years, right? So that's generally what our our background is. Yeah. Well, that's great. So 10 years, the candies have been around for 10 years. This is our technically our 10th year now too for doing that, Congrats. doing the benchmark research. So it's fascinating when you say that because you launched coming out of the, the Great Recession and we've only been measuring candidate experience and nothing but a growth market until now, right? Great. So we had you know the lowest unemployment in over 50 years. We had to the highest unemployment in 90 years in two months. Right. <laughs> and, it's been regardless, and, and regardless of where you sit and this and that, we, we have a horrendous things happening. We have a pandemic, which that is real. Yes. And we have an economic devastation that is very real right now. No doubt. Yep. So talk about, Neil, big picture right now. I mean, obviously, some of the challenges your customers face are the same regardless of boom or bust. But what really is dramatically different with the the, the co- companies you're working with now. Yeah, so I think that there's you know, the way our recruitment marketing agency has been built is that we we have a pretty diverse portfolio, you know, and that was really by design. We, we didn't you know focus on just one industry, which I think could have been really devastating in this type of market because we have a pretty good cross section of technology and finance and retail, and we really feel like there's there's lots of dynamics happening. And, and even going back to March, you know, when it all first started happening, we started to see the retail and food service, you know, organizations really pull back as everything shut down. So we went from, you know, like you said, a really tight, low unemployment market where people are desperate to find retail talent and talent for the the kitchens and servers and, you know, to, you know, a complete stop, you know, companies going to zero jobs open and not spending a dime. And, uh, you know, and some of the others have continued on. And I think that we've seen some of the technology clients and the government service contractors, you know, still continue to go and be steady. And so it's been good to have those in our portfolio. But I think in the last few weeks, we have started to see some of those, those retailers open back up and start hiring. And, you know, we've got a couple of clients that were in that category that they shut it right down to zero and, and had layoffs and furloughs and, and now they're starting to do that uh, hiring at the the store unit location and that's that's a good sign it's not certainly not back to where it was in january february but it's 
it's starting, which is encouraging. I was for a while saying, well, you know, what are your recruiting and hiring plans post COVID? And when these many surveys that we've been, but it's, we're never going to be post COVID. It's not, there's not even, I don't, I'm going to have to stop saying that. Right. Cause right, right. we may get beyond it. And once there's a vaccine and we, the virus is gone and we've moved on, but the, we're, it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be the same world. So right now then, what is, what's the big brand issue, the marketing issue for companies, right? Because I mean, if, at least for those, even if they've frozen hiring altogether, maybe they're starting to open up a little bit, warm up as you just mentioned right now, or industries that didn't stop. Didn't, didn't have a hiring freeze and maybe reduce their rec load, but there's, they were still hiring. But, you know, how everybody res- has been responding to this, right? And that public facing. So what are some things, and you don't have to necessarily mention names, what are some, what are some things that you've seen that are, that are good, that are a good best practice today of a, how they're approaching their brand in reaction to COVID? And what are things that like companies never should have done or shouldn't do? Yeah, I, I think that the, the one thing that we're starting to see as it relates to companies that are still hiring is that they're trying to cut through all the negative noise and let people know. You know, I think that it's been hard to do that for some companies that, you know, that aren't, you know, some of the major supermarket brands that have had a lot of coverage for that. And so I think the ones that are still hiring, because so many people moved, you know, to unemployment and people are unsure about what their next job is, people that have openings are trying to get the word out there. So we've done a lot more employer branding on consumer advertising channels. So we had one campaign that we turned on Spotify, Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Google ads, and we definitely added some job boards to the mix, but it was less than 20% of the mix because we were really just trying to get the, you know, company X is hiring out there across yeah. seven key states where they were, where they had a lot of openings. So we've seen companies switch to some more employer branding versus, you know, what we could see in the other side of the continuum where it's strictly direct response applicant volume. And, and I think people have been kind of shocked that those that are hiring are finding that it's kind of confusing to them why they're not getting more applicants, you know, with the unemployment being so high. That's interesting that you're, is that specific to industries or you're just in general? I think the expectation is that unemployment's high, I should be getting lots of candidates. And I think you have big groups of job seekers that are you know, a little bit shell-shocked, right? You know, they're, yeah. they're trying to yeah. rapidly figure out unemployment. They're trying to figure out whether they, if they're going to get an opportunity to go back to their existing job. So they're, made, they're not really willing to jump into another industry or another company. So I think that there's just this strange purgatory that a lot of candidates are sitting in and the companies are like, have this reaction that they should be in the driver's seat again with unemployment so high. And it, it isn't happening right now. Now that may change after the end of July when benefits packages change and things like that. So I think it's still, there's still some time on the clock to figure it out. I was taught, we did a, we had a, just had a workshop and one of the participants, talent acquisition manager from a manufacturing company in the Detroit area. And they super struggling to, to get hourly workers to work in, in their plants. And we started exploring it more. And it's, I've heard this theme, they still want to receive the benefits that they're getting, the unemployment benefits. So they're not willing to, and they really have struggled finding people, even the referral bonus structure that they had set up to, to get those plant employees was short lived. It worked for a bit and then it stopped. But like you just said, by the time this podcast is published, the the time has run out unless it's extended, and, you know, and not to get political at all, but it is stalemated in Congress right now, whether or not there's more stimulus. And then I hear from other companies like at and and other larger organizations where they're seeing super applicant surges, uh, mostly unqualified, unfortunately, but for a lot of their, like the technicians, right? Like technicians or even other hourly positions that, that they're going. So it's, it is strange, strange days on, I mean, I think that we just can't, we can't model where we're at right now, right? Yeah. I think it's, it's too <laughs> early because it's such an anomaly. And I mean, like you mentioned at the beginning, you know, unemployment rate, their unemployment rate changing so rapidly is just something that we can't predict what's going to happen. I think that, you know, the the numbers don't lie. So when we we do have a client who's engaged in spending money, you know, I think that our, the emphasis on tracking what's happening with those dollars, especially where everybody's sensitive to the overall market and, you know, should they be spending, should they not be spending? You know, if we're going to spend a dollar with a client, we're going to really measure it and make sure that they're aware of what they're getting for it. Because I think it's just the, the microscopes on those dollars. If someone's hiring in this market, the finance folks are, are making sure that it's well spent, but it, it's very difficult to to project out what's going to happen. So 
Uh, I think it's it's challenging for for every every industry and in, in, at least in our client portfolio for sure. Well, we talked we were talking before the podcast too though about our own respective businesses that we run organ and and how to really take more of that aggressive approach, right? Just to try to stay competitively ahead. I mean, again, if you were part of an industry that was completely decimated, like travel and leisure, and that will Mm -hmm. be for years to come, I mean, I understand you're just trying to have a heartbeat, right? Still, Mm -hmm. but for, you know, there was some in the middle, the gray area industries and companies that put the brakes on and never let up yeah. on the brakes. I mean, don't you think that they're going to be, they're going to lose some, tra- even if they're not hiring, they could still be promoting and pipelining and right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, generally when you, when you have down markets, you know, it'll shake out the companies that don't have good fundamentals. And yeah. I think that like, as I mentioned to you earlier, we're, you know, we're in a position where we run pretty lean and we invest, invest a lot in our people so we can deliver the best service possible. And, you know, we, we just added to our staff um, in the down market because we think there's opportunities to show our strength. And, you know, as a, as a business owner, you know, I mean, I started the thing with, you know, no outside funding, we bootstrapped it. And, you know, we've built a, a really good business over the last 10 years, taking good care of the clients. And I think that I see it as an opportunity. I see it as when you talk about showing strength, I think that that's really where our head is, is that, you know, we know that the fundamentals of our business are sound. We can continue to make investments even in a down market. And, you know, we're hoping that, you know, that that reflects in in customers recognizing that and and picking us as their ad agency. No, amen. So let's talk about what yeah. differentiates higher clicks then from the rest of the market? I mean, you, you, you've hit on some of the things, but from like if I was potentially a customer of yours, yeah. why would I want higher clicks to help run my campaigns? To help, why is yeah. that? No doubt. There's a few factors that are, are key differentiators for us in the marketplace. You know, one is that you know, my background is is on the consumer marketing side from Monster. So, you know, we really focus and act like a consumer advertising agency when we work with our clients. And that's why I mentioned the, the, the focus on metrics in the past. You know, when we're when a client works with us, we're curating and handling that budget like it's our own money and we're trying to make sure we get the best value for that. And the way you do that is by tracking everything and making sure that the clients are getting not just cost-effective applies, but you're following the money all the way through to cost per interview, cost per offer, cost per hire, and all those kinds of metrics. So really, I think that there's a different level of detail that we go to when it comes to the metrics as it relates to talent acquisition. Um, the next part is that we have focused just on services. You know, we, we don't have our own proprietary technology. And for some folks, that's a really outstanding partner because then we can give them kind of, un, you know, we don't have our own our own horse in the game, right? We can give them the feedback on the technology options and the media options in the marketplace. Sure. And they know that they're getting it from a pure independent advisor. Some other ad agencies have decided to get into the technology business and own their own technology, build it, buy it through, through acquisition. And you know that's just a different model. And I think that that's really challenging to build a great technology company and a, good, and a great services company. And so our decision to stay focused on just services is, is really important and strategic to making sure clients get the most out of that value. The other part is that since we are focused on services, we we also added, in addition to our recruitment marketing services, which is the media buying and contracts and creative services, we also added a strategic consulting group. And so that consulting group helps clients with, you know, figure out their talent acquisition strategy, their recruitment process optimization, technology selection. So, you know, kind of like a, you know, one of the, the big consulting firms, but in a smaller, more nimble package focused on TA. You know, we really, we think that by having that strategic consulting group, it's all former TA practitioners. And by having them available to help that TA executive solve their biggest problems, that's that's really why we have that consulting team. See, that's huge. I know, I mean, you know, the services side can also, you have tougher margins there too, right? Absolutely, yeah. Thinner yep. margins. But however, I think in your model, being more agnostic to the technology and knowing that it does come and go and that there are new point solutions here and then, you know, consolidation that happens, you leave yourself open to put the best package together for your customers, right? Of what you are, yeah. or the recommendations, at least, that you're going to make. Of yeah. This is what you should be doing and using. And we're going to help you on, on all that services side. So that it does seem like that's, that is an advantage. Yeah, I mean, I think what we know is that there's always going to be change, right? That yeah. I mean, if you look over the last 10 years, the different technology companies that have come in and out of the space or come in and, and you know, flamed out or been acquired in, in really good stories, this, there's been dozens and dozens of them. And, and I think that it's our job to stay up to speed on what's 
new and relevant and how do customers apply that to you know make a better candidate experience and get more applicants and hires you know <laughs> it's funny you just said there's always going to be a change and i was going to say no shit <laughs> and then i thought wait this is a family show so yeah, yeah. i just yeah. but i mean but seriously though no shit yeah. i mean it's be it, it is yeah it's that's even I don't even know what to say else about that. That is just yeah. constant well, all the time. But you just touched on candidate experience. So what are some of the considerations when you're working with your customers? Because there's a lot of you know programmatic advertising that happens. There's a lot of automation that, that you're helping probably them to advise on and manage too, that the candidates themselves don't care about unless they're in the space, right? But it does impact their experience. What are some of the considerations that you're recommending to your customers when it comes to candidate experience? You mentioned programmatic, and that's been a big part of our overall strategy in helping clients. I mean, we've been working on programmatic job ad campaigns since they came out. Um, and certainly uh, extremely important, but you know, that's just a way that folks are transported from job sites back to the career site or back to a landing page. So I think that what we're finding is that a lot of the career sites and applicant tracking vendors are, are still having you know less than optimal challenges. So depending on uh, you know, less than optimal performance when it comes to getting those conversions, I think that we see, depending on the client situation, the type of job, the tolerance for the persona in each candidate for an app apply process. And, you know, if it's if it's a candidate that's not going to tolerate a heavy apply process, then we've been doing a lot more lightweight landing page work. So that way we can do lead capture. And that's not a new concept. It's just a matter of how do we make sure that that lead page is set up properly? How is do we make sure we want to make sure it's mobile optimized. And then most importantly, you know, how does that impact the recruiter workflow? So that way someone's getting back to that candidate that's not sitting in ATS, that they're sitting in a landing page or in a CRM or something like that. So I think that it's, you know, getting people through the front door is, is important, but also making sure that you talk through how the follow-up happens. And we've, we've run into situations where clients have moved from one agency to us and or another agency to us. And, you know, there's just these workflow items are not worked out in some cases. And that's really bad for the client because they're the ROI, maybe they're getting a really good cost per apply, but if they're all sitting there, you know, these are perishable items as far as I'm concerned. When candidate expresses interest, you know, there's a clock. You know, so that's really one of the things that we're we're trying to work on. When it comes to improving the overall candidate experience, you know, we did launch a new service called HX Lab. And basically, we're implementing uh, neuroscience marketing for clients as we test out their career site, as we test out their creative, as we test out their messaging, and even their job descriptions. Um, the HX Lab is is really a multi-mode assessment of how people react to all those different things that I just mentioned, the career site and the, cre and the creative assets. So we're, we're leveraging eye tracking software as part of that HX lab. We're leveraging biometric responses, heart rate, facial expressions, and, and things along those lines. And we can even work in survey questions to see what the assessment of the, the person, the subject going through the HX lab is versus their actual reaction to it. So this is really advanced consumer marketing technology that we're bringing to recruitment marketing in order to make sure people are thinking about these things before they just plop a career site out to the marketplace. Well, that's really important. And, and be, just in, in the spirit of the theme I keep hearing from many organizations in our greater candy community is automation, automation, automation. But how do we leverage that and and still make it that empathy is is part of it and still and how we're you know communicating on, even automatically and through our career sites and i was going to ask you about that too is there anything that you can share i mean not, you may i don't know if you have any even ca any case studies yet or anything but anybody that you're working with you don't have to name their names if you, but how's that going so what are you finding out as you do this work yeah i mean so first and foremost you mentioned ai and automation and you know it's called the hx lab it's called the human experience lab because there's a massive human element to this transaction, right? right? To I mean, aside from buying a house and getting married, you know, your job is, you know, right up there next to those guys. And yeah. we think that as privacy becomes more and more important to individuals and that constrains how cookies can work, uh, we're going to know less and less about the candidates. In the past, when you've got people trying to track, you know, uh, people coming through multi-site channels and who's going to get attribution and things like that, it's going to matter less and less when people decide not to be tracked. And right. so we think that there's a much stronger opportunity to connect with candidates. And uh, even the, the simplest example so far has been, a set, we've done an assessment on a client's uh, employer branding video. And we're able to look at, you know, 
by the demographics of the people of the subjects in the study do gen gen x people react differently than millennials to the music that comes across and so we'll basically be able to get a, a group of subjects go through the video see at what point during the 90 second video they're more engaged less engaged how do they react to the music how do they react to the images to be frank it's really a massive amount of data that we're getting and then it's a, a matter of having our analysts slice through it and figure out you know what can we actually change and adjust to respond and be uh, more engaged with each, each of those audiences. So fast, it's, fast, yeah, it's still the early days, but it's, it's, uh, it's getting a great reaction in the marketplace. And, and we've got some really, so I think, you know, I would consider some of the thought leaders in the industry in discussion and, and talking about ways they could use it. So it's an exciting time. That's, uh, that is that's very interesting. So, and I don't, as far as I know, there's not anybody else really doing something like this, right? No, I mean, it's, it's definitely, you know, I think we're, we're first to, you know, the re- talent acquisition recruitment marketing industry. And even on the consumer marketing side, this isn't something that, you know, every agency in Madison Ave or, or downtown Boston or LA has in their back pocket. It's, it's a really complex tool set. And, um, you know, but I think that it, you know, Again, when we talk, we're in it for the long haul. We think this is the right move uh, in order to help ca- help ca- clients create the best candidate experience possible by understanding who that candidate is, understanding how the different personas react to your brand assets, and we think that'll pay dividends for each client down the road. No, I g- couldn't agree more. I think that's that's good, super exciting of where where you're going with that. Speaking of where you're going and things, since we're not going to see each other anytime soon probably what else is gonna what else is coming is, is there something top secret you can share with me i promise not to tell anybody yeah yeah, yeah. um well i mean the biggest thing for us is that we've um we've made some investments in a visual dashboard for clients so that's the biggest change that's coming it, it's um it's effectively been in beta for a few months with some of our long-standing clients and you know we think that this is going to be a game changer when it comes to taking data from various media publishers and taking data from the ATS and pushing that all through a visual dashboard. So that's really what's next for us. And I think that that, again, elevates what we're delivering to a TA professional so they don't have to go do, you know, put a bunch of Lego blocks together on their back end, that we can do that for them and do it in a visually engaging way. And the way we've set it up with some of the clients is, you know, if they've got multiple business operating units, we can take that, have one central dashboard for the VP of talent acquisition. And then if you've got a, you know, one of our hospital clients has, you know, five different areas, the clinical, you know, versus physician recruiting, and we can break down the dashboards into those each, each of those business segments, which is, you know, what they want to look at. They want to look at their stuff, but we still need macro visibility in order to be the best strategic partner possible. And those are all custom customized dashboards? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Wow. Yeah, it's a totally customized dashboard. Um, you know, so it's it's something that the more that we can w- walk and talk like we're a consumer ad agency, we feel like that gives us a differentiator in, in the TA no, I, marketplace. I, I completely agree with that, Neil. That's that's fantastic. So, and you already kind of touched on it in regards to you. Got, there's a definitely a big human element emphasis on the work that you do um, and as, as it relates to what it's, it is like to be a candidate today, yesterday, tomorrow, and how companies can better engage those those candidates through the the services that you offer and we appreciate your support too as well for support of of the candies why even today is it important that companies measure their candidate experience I mean, I think that people have long memories when it comes to a bad experience. And I think that that's, you know, that's really what uh, each company needs to think about in this time. It's it's relatively easy to throw up your arms and be a victim to the circumstances. But I think it's time to you know, roll up your sleeves and work twice as hard to make sure that the candidates have a good experience. Because I think people are, you know, people are struggling in general with the economy, with the emotional impact of everything that's happening. And, you know, it doesn't mean you have to hire everyone, but you certainly want to treat everyone one, you know, in, in a way that uh, leaves a positive, you know, fingerprint on your brand. Amen, brother. Amen. Thank you for, for sharing that. The last question I always like to ask is besides all the work things, because we're always working, right? All yeah. the time. What else does Neil like to do? What else does Neil like? <laughs> uh, I usually spend a lot of time, at, uh, you know, at the hockey rink with uh, watching lots of sure. hockey with my kids. That's so right. I'm, I'm a right. professional yeah. spectator of, you know, and, and yeah. I think that uh, I've been on the bench for a while because, you know, all the kids sports have been... I know. You know, but we we we're, we're lucky that we live in uh, in a beach town just north of Boston, right? We're in, so we spend a lot of time at the beach, and uh, you know, it, it's in a responsible, socially distanced way. Uh, good good sure. answer. Yeah, well, no, exactly. We're, we're on board with that too, right? Because we live in a beach town on the West Coast. Yeah. And girls, there's no soccer probably this fall. 
for the girls, right. which they're kind yeah. of bummed about, but the, for our girls. And, but yeah, there's still lots of things that we're, we're very grateful that we can do and get out and still be safe. And, yeah. and, uh, which is, which makes it really nice. Yeah. So I guess my answer is that I'm not, I'm, I'm trying to develop new hobbies, right? Cause like the, uh, <laughs> the sports, the, 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 the youth sports thing is, uh, is on hold a little bit. So I actually just started reading, uh, Ernest Hemingway's short stories. So that's nice. what I'm trying to dig into, right? You know, Good so I, it, I, I, as part of the COVID, uh, yeah, I, our team grew COVID beards. So we had a lot of Hemingway lookalikes with all of our, our gray beards and, um, <laughs> and so that inspired me to pick up the pick up his short stories and get uh, good at how are you liking it so far I, I love it it's amazing and it's actually it's a great book because it talks about uh it has multiple versions of his stories okay. uh, of the same stories so you can see what he cut out and you know um it was just interesting learning about him and his writing style and yep. the one thing he was he, he wrote for like the kansas city star and and he had it basically as a correspondent in europe and had to they had to pay per word when they when he sent stories back and yeah. so he writing succinctly was just the key factor so that was no it makes different. sense and he was he was also one i can't i don't have the exact quotation but he knows really 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 good writing is means really 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 good editing yes yeah yeah <laughs> so. yeah it's been it's been great you know it's uh, i'm a numbers guy right you know so it's kind of sure. like to it's like exploring a different part of my brain oh very nice well now that's great great to hear and hopefully the 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 kids sports will come back next year maybe Sometime, yeah someday yeah. someday someday soon well listen thanks neil for being on the candy shop talk podcast and always a pleasure and hopefully again we'll also see each other in person again at some point so sounds good kevin thank you so much i appreciate it